before we test the level, should I be louder or quieter? Louder. Perfect, is it perfect? <laughs> louder. Oh. A little louder? Then I'll have to not shout. That's a little too loud, I think. I can hear myself. No? Is that all right? I'm hearing a little ringing, but I guess it's okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me in New Canaan. It's so much better than the old Canaan, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Uh, which was when I came here about 15 years ago, I think. Um, actually, it hasn't changed very much, and I know that you like that. Um, I've only been through here once before. I guess that was kind of a joke, and it just seemed like the case. Um, I came through, so I was at the National Endowment for the Arts for a while, and we sponsored the Glass House when it, when it became a museum. Um, so I got to come up for that. And I, I had a brief touch of your downtown, um, but didn't spend the time that I should. And you know, as someone, as you'll hear, as someone who's really into downtowns and works mostly on downtowns, um, you've got a great one. I think you know that. Uh, and it was really wonderful to have a, a, a tour today. I was, uh, I tend to spiral inwards when I'm toured. People tend to spiral me into the center, and that's what happened today. Uh, so we started in a vehicle, um, we started as suburban as possible, actually in a suburban. No, it was a Tahoe, thanks to Carl Chevrolet. Um, and we ended up on foot and, um, you know, when I go to a place, I first study it in, in the Google and then uh, get to know it again in person. And I knew there was some topography. The Google doesn't really communicate that. But you have just the right amount of topography and the perfect little grid and it's really, uh, an absolute gem, and uh, I am uh, looking forward to perhaps changing it a little. So, um, here's where I have to turn this on. So yes, most of my talks are titled this way, uh, fill in the blank. Uh, I have been looking at New Canaan for some time. Most of my talks are called also The Walkable City, I'm trying to find a spot where I can see you and the screen. I think this will work. Uh, and I give two types of talks, why we need to make our cities more walkable and how to make our cities more walkable. The why component you're not getting tonight. And you're not getting it tonight because I think you're here because you probably already value walking and walkability. Uh, but also because I only have so much time, I want to spend my time as usefully as possible. And you can see that talk in 15 minutes on TED, or at least a short version. A short version of why we need to make our cities walkable uh, is at TED.com under my name, uh, S-P-E-C-K. So uh, we're going to jump right into the good stuff, which is how to make New Canaan more walkable, which gets into what I call somewhat tongue-in-cheek, my general theory of walkability, but it's, it, it tries to be a real theory, um, you know, which is a hypothesis that you test and refine as you move forward. It's the backbone of my book, Walkable City, which I, has anyone here read Walkable City? Oh, good. Um, well, I hope more of you will read it, and you can pick it up after the show. Um, uh, but the general theory of walkability asks, how in the typical American community in particular, do you get people to make the choice to walk? In a culture in which most people own cars, and driving is heavily subsidized, and, and the car is typically there in the driveway between you and everything, right? How do you get people to make that choice in a community to walk? And the answer is the walk has to be as good as the, the drive, and to do that, it must do four things simultaneously. It needs to be useful, it needs to be safe, it needs to be comfortable, and it needs to be interesting. That's the organization of the book Walkable City, and it's the organization of this, of this lecture tonight. So I'm gonna go through each of those categories and talk about how they work, and then talk about how they apply uh, to New Canaan. So the first category, the reason to walk, walking being useful, this is a, uh, a lesson I learned from my mentors, Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, who created the New Urbanist Movement. Um, starting in the early 80s, I joined them in 1990, I spent a decade with them, and Andres used to um, give this talk called uh, The Story of Planning, and he described how the planning profession was founded when people who weren't yet called planners um, were you know, lamenting the dark satanic mills and said, hey, we need to move the housing away from the factories. And they did, 
and lifespans increased immediately and dramatically, and the planners were hailed as heroes, and we like to say they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since. So you have the separation of the landscape into large areas of single use. It's come to be known as Euclidean zoning, where uh, uh, you know nothing is usually very close to anything else. Uh, we now know this was wrong. This is not taught anymore in planning school, but most places when I arrive to do a plan, there's already a plan that exists on the property and it generally looks like this, right, across America. Now, I was an art history major, which they say was not the most lucrative choice, uh, but I can tell you when it comes to planning, you don't want a Rothko, you want a Syrah. Right? Syrah was the pointillist. And this, of course, is Manhattan. This is not a zoning map, this is actually a land use map. The red color is vertically mixed use, so you can see it's even more mixed than it looks. The finer grain you're zoning, the more confetti-like, uh, obviously walking is gonna be more useful because <laughs> other parts of your daily life are close at hand. So this gets me now to the fundamental new urbanist argument. I heard Andres give a talk in 1989 called Towns versus Sprawl, and it made me change my career. I thought I was going to be perfectly happy designing the bathrooms and kitchens of the very rich, but instead of going into architecture, uh, which I completed my studies in, um, I went into town planning at their firm, and he told this story, which became the book Suburban Nation, and it was really the best story I had ever heard, because it made me understand the American landscape, it made me understand why I loved certain places and hated other places, and it made me realize that it was, at least at that time, and, and, and still a bit, illegal to build more of the places that we love. And so he contrasted, and we still do, he refuses to give this talk anymore. He's, he's outgrown it. I, I haven't really. But we identified that there's really only two tested ways to build communities, uh, the traditional neighborhood and suburban sprawl. Uh, does anyone recognize this town? Could be near here, it's actually Newburyport. Massachusetts, near where I live. But the traditional neighborhood is defined by being diverse, compact, and walkable. That's how you define a neighborhood. There's, uh, I have a laser. You can see there's places to live, bigger houses and smaller houses, and places to work, factories, and um, shopping, places to shop, places to recreate. Most of your daily needs are within walking distance. So that's the diversity, at least of use, which is what you need if you're gonna get diversity of people. Uh, you start with diversity of use and diversity of housing type. Secondly, it's compact. You're actually looking at several different neighborhoods of New Report, and across cultures and throughout time, neighborhoods have tended to be about a five minute walk from edge to center. If you think about a place we probably both know, Manhattan and the different, you know, Tribeca and the East Village and the West Village and um, Soho, and you map those out, you see about that scale as well. But that happens all over the world and throughout history. Uh, and then it's walkable because there are lots of streets, and because there's lots of streets, no one street needs to be all that big um, and threatening. So sprawl, in contrast, you know, the neighborhood developed naturally in response to human needs. It was not invented. Sprawl was an invention pretty much after the war, uh, the wars, and um, it's defined in the opposite way. It's clearly not compact, right? thus the name sprawl. It's not diverse. A whole square mile might hold just one use, like in the blob map or one house, right, over and over and over again. Uh, and it's not walkable because so few of the streets actually connect. You've got loops and cul-de-sacs. And the streets that do connect have to handle all the traffic of the entire metropolis. You'll notice there's not a single front door on this street. It only moves as many cars as it can, as quickly as it can. We call them traffic sewers because that's how they're designed. And, um, uh, you know, everyone wants a house on a cul-de-sac for the safety of their children but you're actually 350% more likely to be killed by a car in this environment than you are in that environment. Because once you leave the safety of your cul-de-sac, you're in this very dangerous uh, auto zone. So it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, the places where you only work, places where you only shop. Schools get bigger and bigger. People consolidate their school systems. They're proud of their larger schools, but of course the bigger a school is, the fur further away from you it is. And the ratio of size of parking lot you know, to school building in this South Florida school tells you all you need to know about this school, which is that you know, no child has ever walked to it. Busing doesn't even work in this environment because it's so far flung. And uh, you know, the, the statistics in terms of kids getting in car crashes, of course, is very high. Um, 
you seem to have that uh, here as well. Um, and one of the things I regretted seeing, one of the only things I regretted driving around today was seeing how many kids were parked at your high school. Um, and then even the athletic facilities are, are consolidated and supersized. So Weston, which is kind of Florida expanding into the Everglades, um, has eight, you know, they're proud of their eight soccer fields and eight baseball diamonds and everything else. Um, but a kid that lives here actually has a mile and a half drive to get there. I mapped it. And um, it's preposterous, right? But it makes perfect sense if you begin to design a society with the presumption that everyone is going to drive everywhere. Then you make these sort of choices. So the one part that everyone forgot to count, this is not Photoshop, this is LA. The one part that everyone forgot to count was the, uh, the highways. And the understanding that if you separate every use from every other use and reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then you're gonna have to have a lot of roads to move people around. I always tell people it's a two-part deal. You know, this is the American dream for some people, the house with nothing around it but other houses, but this American dream comes with this American nightmare uh, that all these separated uses generate. So, uh, and often to absurd extremes, uh, this is near my, my home in Boston, um, and the experience of being in these places. <laughs> this is not Photoshop, this is in South Florida also. And the, the toll it places on families, the longer your commute, the longer your commute, the more likely you are to be divorced, that's a fact. Uh, being a driver can be a real drag, and being a pedestrian can be even worse. So, um, I'm gonna stop talking about making new places and start talking about existing places, but when you're making new places, which we do every day in America, but we tend to make them in pieces. We make the equivalent of cities every day in the US, but they tend to land as office parks, or housing subdivisions, or shopping centers, or institutional sectors, right? But what you need to know when you're making new places is that it's the same stuff in the sprawl environment as it is in the traditional neighborhood. But how big is it? How well integrated is it? And honestly, do you have a dendritic, a branching street network that goes from the collector to the, from the local to the collector to the arterial to the highway? Or do you have this fine grained network of small blocks and many streets? Because this, that when you're starting to make a, a new place, the first thing you need to do is make small blocks and many streets, and then a real walkable neighborhood is possible. So those are the two models. Now, you have both, right? Actually, in, in New Canaan, most cities I speak in have a good amount of both models. Because New Canaan is older and was planned so wisely, most of New Canaan is the traditional uh, network of streets, particularly evident in your downtown core. I had to cross into Stanford to get the other model, right? This is across the parkway uh, and a bit south. Um, the idea of, uh, oops, uh-oh. I pushed the wrong button. I think I, I'm, I'm glad that, the, that um, my tech help, oh, I'm back, okay. I don't know if this will disappear on it, so yeah, no, thank you. Um, so here you can see there's no block structure, and it's pretty much one use, taking up a very large parcel. So you have both, but it's not in New Canaan, so we're all right. Now, when you look at a downtown now, and remember we're in this first category, the useful walk. When you look at a downtown, you have to ask yourself this question, what uses in the downtown are missing or underrepresented? And I think underrepresented is the key word here. Um, in most American downtowns, and yours as well, you have an underrepresentation of housing. And of course, housing is poised to take the best advantage of the other things that the downtown has to offer. Jane Jacobs was commenting on Wall Street around 1970, no, 1960. And she said, why, why would 400,000 people come to work in Wall Street every day? Why doesn't Wall Street have a single great restaurant or a single great gym? It said the, which the answer sheet was what she called time spread. A great restaurant and a great gym needs an evening crowd as well as a lunchtime crowd. And so she said, you can't rely on bringing people downtown, you have to put them there. And this was in the era, of course, when Robert Moses was laying out all his highways that were dra was draining the downtown of people. Of course, Wall Street is very much different now because a ton of people uh, live in it. Um, great uh, small additions to housing are coming to and near 
your, um, your downtown. Um, I've, I've partnered in the past with, with Bruce Binfield, and uh, 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 this is a wonderful, this is the rendering. This is the rendering, and this is the building. I've never seen a building that looks so much like the rendering. <laughs> so you have some real talent here. Uh, great little additions of housing in your downtown, and of course some larger developments that I saw as well. But the downtown, oh, and then I wanted to say, and then a whole bunch of proposals that haven't happened, right? Lots of people are coming forward with, um, uh, you know, housing for older people or just uh, trying to put more housing in the downtown. And it's really hard because there's always resistance to this sort of thing in the downtown. And the point I want to make is that, well, first of all, the ratio of people who want to live in downtown walkable areas is probably 10 times the, the amount of real estate that's available in those areas. So there's an unmet demand for almost any kind of housing in city centers. Secondly, if you can find a place that's attainable in a city center or a town center, you can live a much more attainable lifestyle because you don't need to have a car to drive everywhere else, especially when you have a train stop. Was it the last stop to heaven? Is that what you call it? Um, when you have a train stop that takes you right into Manhattan, but also to a major to Stanford, which is a major employment center. Um, but also think about it this way: as new people land in your community, when they land downtown ideally without a car, they're gonna have the least burden on your infrastructure and the least burden on your life. They're not gonna be gumming up your streets, they're not gonna be gumming up your parking um, if they arrive without a car in the downtown. And really, it's only in the downtown that that car-free lifestyle is possible. So um, bringing more people into your downtown, particularly in apartments uh, that don't have an automobile attached to them, is the best way to, to grow your community. Um, so, second question, and I've kind of hinted at this uh, as well. When I go to a place, usually there's a dinner afterwards for the sponsors, and about a half an hour into the dinner, I say, can we stop talking about parking? <laughs> this is what everyone wants to talk about. So, it, typically in downtowns, your parking is underpriced and overrepresented, and the, what I wanted to share with you was the theories that some of you, I imagine, have heard of Donald Shoup. And Donald Shoup has figured parking out. Donald Shoup uh, is the grand dean of American parking. He's got like four PhDs. He taught at UCLA for all these years. Um, his famous book is called The High Cost of Free Parking. Uh, I, I met him uh, at a few different conferences. We've overlapped. I want to say about this book, it's 423, no, it's 723 pages. It's like, you know, four pounds. Um, but I had jury duty, so I got to read it. And I actually turned it into a chapter of my book, Walkable City, so you don't have to read Don's book. But, um, and, and he, he edited my chapter to make sure that it was, it was, a, it was correct. Um, but he's an amazing guy, and he figured parking out, and basically, he has three rules. So. He starts by saying, you know, what are we really talking about when we talk about parking? Well, first of all, we're asking the wrong question. And the question that most communities ask is, how can we have enough parking? Which is a, a reasonable question. But the question, I'm gonna keep saying cities, I know you're a town, forgive me, but um, cities and towns. Um, the real question to ask is, how can, it, the real question to ask is, how can we provide, design, and manage parking so that cities thrive, or towns thrive? And if you ask that question, you get a very different answer than if you ask, how can we have enough? And his answer is this three-legged stool, these three rules. The first one is to eliminate the on-site, in other words, off-street parking requirement. It doesn't eliminate parking. It just eliminate the arbitrary rule that the city applies on that parking. The on-site parking requirement has caused all sorts of mayhem <laughs> in terms of opera houses being turned into parking garages in places like Detroit. Uh, Donald Shoup illustrates all the things that it causes not to happen. For example, you've got a piano store and you want to turn it into a restaurant, but the requirement for a restaurant is three times as much parking per square foot as a piano store, and you don't have any more parking, so the piano store does not become a restaurant. Right? It's stories like that that happen every day. He also tells the story of Alma Place in Palo Alto, which was a, a, a very low-income uh, housing development that uh, they managed, and by the way, right next to the 
um, to the Palo Alto train station. And they managed to argue from like two cars per unit for, the, for, for these almost homeless people who barely had cars at all. They managed to argue it down to 0 0.67 cars per unit, so two cars for every three units. That increased the cost of the building by 38%. So imagine how many fewer units they were able to provide for the people that needed them. Um, these requirements are, are of minimum parking standards, are often arbitrary and often wrong. And the way he puts it is, removing off-street parking requirements will not eliminate off-street parking, but will instead stimulate an active commercial market for it. You allow the marketplace to function. You allow people to pay for parking what it's worth, but more importantly, you allow builders to only build the parking that they want to build. Um, and you know, cities like, like, like New York have parking maximums, uh, not parking minimums because they're more urban and walkable. So this is a snowballing effect that the last two years has been rolling downhill across the US, city after city, and I would direct you to the Parking Reform Network, which is this little mom and pop operation that is uh, taking the country by storm. And just, it seems like every week, another significantly sized city is just saying, you know, we're gonna let the market do this work. It's not the role of the city to arbitrarily impose parking minimums and they're rolling back them, their, their standards, and I would encourage you to do that. Secondly, price on-street parking in line with its value. So again, you want to allow the market to function. You want to allow people who want to spend and have lots of money to spend some of that money to park nearby where the shops are. I always say um, Daddy Warbucks should always be able to find a place near the furrier. So <laughs> this was one of the first ever uh, it was in Redwood City, California, one of the first ever downtown parking pricing plans. And you can see it's most expensive where everyone's shopping, and then it's a little less expensive uh, on the side streets, and then even cheaper surrounding it. And the um, uh, parking garages uh, are particularly cheap because people, we want to attract people to the garages in this case and not on the street. Um, eventually, you will want to charge more for your on-street parking. Uh, because it allows people to go to the right spot to put their car. And um, downtowns resist that. Like merchants think, now when you show them the evidence, it might change their mind, it might not. I'll be giving you an example from Norwalk in a minute. But when you show merchants the evidence, they, they see, at least, that, that business districts thrive when you charge the right amount for parking because it creates availability. And I forgot to say, the right price is the price that generates one empty space per, per curb face, you know, per block face, all day long. So whatever that price is, and sometimes you have to rejigger it different parts of the day, whatever that price is that causes there to always be some convenient parking is the right price to charge, but the merchants resist that. So Don Shoup invented what's called the parking benefits district. Your meter money makes a difference in old Pasadena. And what the money from the meters pays for is beautification, storefronts, trees, sidewalks. What used to be rear alleys full of dumpsters is now a consolidated, every, every block has its own trash compactor and the alleys are this beautiful pedestrian system because of the money that was generated by charging the right price for parking. And it's a virtuous cycle in which everything gets better um, as the price of parking goes up. So think about that. My funny story is that I spoke in Norwalk, we called it Norwalkability. <coughs> Um, about six years ago, seven years ago, and just coincidentally, I don't know if Donald Shoup had spoken, but everyone was talking about Donald Shoup's theories, and there was a flyer that was being handed out, and I was in a restaurant, and someone handed me this flyer, and it said, Donald Shoup's theories of parking are true, just not here in Norwalk, <laughs> which I thought was the funniest thing I'd ever read. Um, anyway, that's the first category. We're done with the useful walk. There's more to say about transit and, and other things, but. Um, I'm gonna stop there so I can keep going. The second category, the safe walk, this is where I spend most of my time. And most of the work I do in cities, and most of what I say tonight will be in this category. For a number of reasons, but largely because it's the thing that cities can change the fastest. If you think about the useful walk, which is the use of the buildings, and if you think about the last two categories, the uh, comfortable walk and the interesting walk, all three of those are a function of the buildings, mostly private, that line the streets. And that's something the cities can influence with investment and with zoning and other things in the longer term. 
But most cities own most of their streets and can change their streets very quickly. I've done 15 of what I call walkability studies in communities, and we more and more have just focused on what the, uh, you know, the, 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 the leadership wants to see change before the next election. So we focus on the streets and we try to make changes to the streets because we can much more quickly than changing zoning. Making our streets safe is in the context of a pedestrian death epidemic. You may be aware of it. That since 2009, we've had a, uh, a, a tremendous increase, 83% increase in the number of pedestrians who are being hit and killed uh, by vehicles. Um, there's a book called Right of Way by Angie Schmidt that I would recommend to you and tries to figure out why this is happening. The two main factors are the suburbanization of poverty, the fact that a lot of people now are living without cars in a landscape like I showed you, the sprawl landscape, which was never meant to be inhabited without cars. And so that's been a real uh, uh, death zone. Um, and then secondly, the advent of the high hooded SUV uh, and pickup truck and the impact, no pun intended, uh, that that has on uh, collisions. Where you get hit, how long it takes to slow the vehicle, how much momentum the vehicle has, how heavy it is, um, and uh, you, are, you are more than twice as likely to kill, be killed if you're hit by a SUV. I, by the way, I had an SUV and I read Angie's book and I traded in for station wagon. I can't be the guy that kills someone with my car. I don't want to be and I, I can't. So, um, that's a real issue. We thought it wasn't cell phones because they have cell phones in Europe and they don't have the same, the, the, the death rates in Europe are still declining. But then someone just wrote an article saying, well, in Europe they have more stick shifts so no one's on their cell phones while they're driving. So it may be cell phones as well. We're not sure. Um, this is a page from one of your local reports talking about traffic safety and there were actually a, more crashes than I thought over 2,500 crashes in New Canaan over the last five years. Um, and most of them are uh, the 42 crashes involving pedestrians, primarily in the downtown area. So um, downtown is a concern. Now, when we're trying to solve this problem, we realize very quickly that it's, it, you know, presuming that we're not getting everyone out of their SUVs, it's, pr it's principally about speed. A car going 35 miles an hour is seven times as likely to kill you as a car going 25 miles an hour. And uh, it, it's, a, you know, it's a logarithmic relationship, and each mile per hour uh, really counts. So the question is, what aspects of the environment are causing drivers to go faster, or causing drivers to go slower, and that's what we can work on. And I wanna make a really important point that, that undergirds all of this, which is that that street planning in the U.S. grew out of highway traffic engineering in the U.S. And the mindset of a highway engineer is how can I make that highway as safe as possible? And it has to do with how you set your speed on a highway. If you're like me, you get on the highway, you look for a speed limit sign, and then you set your cruise control for nine miles an hour over that sign, right? Or whatever you're comfortable with. So your speed is a constant. If your speed is a constant, then anything you can do to reduce friction, to create elbow room, to reduce opportunities for conflict is gonna make the drive safer. Wider lanes, no parallel parking, no opposing traffic, no trees, right? Anything you can do that increases uh, forgiveness is gonna make that street safer. But now think about how you drive when you're in, in, in downtown New Canaan. You're not looking at any speed limit signs. You're adjusting to the behavior. You're adjusting to the environment around you. And in fact, the thing that determines your slowing down is the lack of elbow room, the lack of forgiveness, right? Narrower lanes, parallel parking, street trees, opposing traffic. Those are all things that cause you to drive more safely. And it's, it's been many decades that the American highway engineering uh, community has slowly begun to realize that we need to design downtowns different, or anywhere where people are different from highways. Um, Vision Zero, which you've probably heard about in Europe, is all about constricting the road space so that no one would ever think about driving, that was not constricting the road space, um, so that no one would ever think about driving faster than the speed limit. Uh, we haven't yet made that the standard in the US, and a bunch of us are working to do that. So what are the factors? The first one I'll mention is the number of lanes. The more lanes there are, of course, the more it's like a highway, the faster people go, the harder it is to cross, the longer it takes to get across. Um, and 
The first question is, do you have streets that have more lanes than they need? Now, progressive cities like Boston, which have great transit and great walking and biking, are making an effort actually to reduce the number of cars driving through a downtown. When I go to a place, particularly in many of the red states that I work in, we don't try to do that. We say, no, we're gonna accept the amount of traffic that you have, but maybe you have some streets that have more lanes than they need. This is Oklahoma City. They were named by Prevention Magazine the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country. <laughs> not, not true. They hadn't been to a lot in Oklahoma. Um, but the mayor came to me and said, what do we do about this? And I said, let's do a walkability study. And he said, what's that? And I said, I don't know. And it was my first of, as I said, 15. And we looked at the car counts in the downtown core. Now we know that a two lane street without any center turn lanes or right turn lanes, nothing but two lanes, two way street in each direction. No engineer will argue with you. It'll handle 10,000 cars per day. And so we looked at downtown and we saw these streets, 6,000, 7,000, 4,000. These were all streets that were four to six lanes and were, were to remain four to six lanes. And they had these car counts on them. And we said, wow, you know, you've got a two lane street taking up six lanes and we can do something about that. Uh, coincidentally, Devon Energy was building this 51 story building in the downtown core, generating $200 million in tax increment. And the day my walkability study landed, they said, what can we spend this money on? And they decided to rebuild every street in the downtown core, 40 blocks of downtown. And uh, I got to design the curb to curbs of all these streets. We were able to remove a third of the travel lanes <laughs> overall. We were able to double the amount of on-street parking and we were able to create a bike network where there'd been no, no bike network before and add a tram. So this street, four lane one way, became this two lane two way with tram. This street became this street, et cetera. I mean, this is what you do if you have money, right? You rebuild. <laughs> I always tell cities though, you don't need to rebuild, you just need to restripe. <laughs> you can restripe a whole downtown for the price of just rebuilding a few streets and that's the kind of work we do in most cities. So in contrast, Cedar Rapids, also four lane one ways, did not want to pay to rebuild, um, but they had this street system and we changed it to this street system, number of lanes, see before, after, which allowed us to turn the parking from this where red is angled and yellow is parallel to this. So we added a ton more parking. We were able to turn the bike network from this to that. And they did it just with their annual uh, improvement budget as they were repaving streets anyway. So that street became this street. This person's figuring out how to not bike, but park in a bike lane. Um, so you look at the car counts and you look at the number of lanes. One of the rules that was fought, but eventually won, the engineers overruled the other engineers, in Oklahoma City was if, the, if a street has less than 10,000 cars per day, it does not get any turn lanes. And the old engineers predict, predicted Carmageddon. It's gonna be a complete cluster. And of course it wasn't. There was no problem at all, even during construction. So you've got Cherry Street here, um, four lanes. And I, I'm gonna apologize because I'm naming a number of state streets which are gonna be harder for you to change. I just want you to be aware. Some of the streets which you can change are local roads and some of them are state roads. State roads are not off the table, but it's a lot more work. Um, Cherry Street is a state route. But you can see it's three to four lanes running through the center of town here. Um, looks like that. It's got 7,700 cars per day on it. It's in, where it intersects Main Street. Main Street has 6,400 cars per day. Um, the next street over, South Avenue, 5,700. Cherry there is 2,200. Getting up in the corner, I forget the names, Park Ave, 4,800 intersecting with Elm, 800. These aren't even Oklahoma City numbers. So you have few enough cars on these streets that they could all be two lane roads because of that. Um, Pine and Cherry is one of many examples, sorry. Um, we also, because you have all these lanes, you need to have signals. Now, this is artwork, this is not like a roundabout signal or anything. But, but um, what's remarkable is the other part of the story. Because when you reduce the number of lanes in any intersection to two lanes, where they're each going in different directions, then you can, then you can have always stop signs. 
Now, there was a study done in Philadelphia. The, the warranting rules changed in 1997, and they had to change 472 signals into always stop signs. They collected data on 199 of them. Crashes dropped 24%, severe injury crashes 63%, severe pedestrian injury crashes dropped by 68%. If you think about it, you'll understand why, right? A, a, an always stop sign, only the most flagrant offender is going through it with any speed at all. People coast through it, sure, but you never have that green light that says speed. You never have the yellow light that says speed up. <laughs> when you're going through the intersection, in fact, traffic engineers in, in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from the elimination of the local habit, the Philadelphia habit to speed up to beat the red. Um, but it's, it's just the fact that, that you're never going fast through an always stop sign. So if, this is my illustration of, you know, of the good city. You know, the bicyclist is kind of going the wrong way. The wheelchair user feels perfectly comfortable because they understand that um, the vehicles are going to stop when they get to the intersection. This is downtown Albuquerque, where I also did a walkability study. And we looked at the amount of traffic on each street, and wherever a moderate or light, light or negligible street hit another light or negligible street, um, we recommended replacing the signals with stop signs. I recommended it at 18 locations. I think they did it at 11. And this is a clip from the news station, the local news station. And what happened was they reverted, they converted the signals to stop signs. And then people were really angry because it was a change. So they bagged up the stop signs. And then the people were even angrier because what they had realized was they were actually getting through the downtown faster when there were stop signs, which seems strange because they're, they're stopping. You have to stop at every intersection, but you're never sitting there waiting. And so the great kind of hidden secret of converting signals to stop signs is that you actually get through downtown faster because you're never sitting around. So those two things together, narrowing the number of lanes down to one in each direction, and then identifying those locations where you have signals um, where you don't really need them anymore, um, particularly at, you know, at these intersections, is, is I, I think, the biggest opportunity to downtown. Now, not all the roads are state roads. Um, on those that are, you've got an issue. I believe the state also has some say over signalization overall downtown. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I do know it's the right, it's the right thing for you to do. Um, the next is the width of the lanes themselves. Andre Swan used to show this slide, and he'd say, the typical street to the typical subdivision in America is now wide enough to allow you to witness the curvature of the earth. <laughs> and it's true, um, because the standards have shifted. The standards, just, just, there's been this mission creep, and the lanes get wider and wider. So this is a subdivision from the 80s. This is one from the, uh, from the 2000s. You can see 80s, 2000s, so just wider roads, the wider a lane is, the faster you go. That's, I'm sure you know that as a driver. Um, it's just a, a statistical fact. When we build new communities like this one, this is called Ion, it's outside of uh, Charleston. Um, you know, we, we, this is a two-way street. Certainly, residential streets can be tremendously narrow because they handle very few trips. You don't need to have a lane in each direction. This is a shared 12-foot uh, lane. And the developer, Vince Graham, who's very, uh, he's a very good public speaker, and he goes to conferences and he quotes this philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. And it's, it's true. So, uh, Portland, I was talking to a former Portlander earlier today. Portland, Oregon, always ahead of the curve, uh, has this skinny streets program for residential neighborhoods where you only need 12 or 13 feet between vehicles in order to get through on a residential street. Um, but we really need to talk about downtown streets, commercial streets, heavily used streets, because most cities now are enforcing an 11 to 12 foot standard. Um, <clears throat> thank God we now have NACTA. Thank God we now have NACTA, um, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials um, putting us back to the old 10 foot standard. 10 feet is, is plenty wide. A standard parking space these days is eight feet. This is a seven foot parking space against a 10 foot lane. <clears throat> you see it's a little tight, so you might go a little bit slower, but certainly you're gonna get your vehicle through. Now, I, I noticed with interest that um, the three hot spots in New Canaan, two of them are off ramps, but the other one is Main Street and East Avenue intersection. And to ask myself, what, why would people get beginning in crashes in this intersection 
Well, it's two lanes of traffic, but it's 40 feet across. And that doesn't even count the, the, the shoulders that are there next to the stripe. I took this picture today, walking around. It's a very long place to cross. And, um, and there's, there's just a lot more roadway. Um, and I was talking to Tiger, who is your director of public works, who's, who's really on, on the ball. Um, and this is a location that they, they, whoops, this is a location they have been considering, um, uh, you know, doing the classic neck down solution, where you actually narrow the travelable way to the, the template of the semi that's gonna make the turn, but as tight as you can get to that template, and then you'd have a lot uh, less space to cross. Looking now a little further up Main Street, I noticed that there's a truck parked here <laughs> and still two lanes of traffic. A classic Main Street is, is 36 feet, eight, 10, 10, eight. Park, drive, drive, park. So this should be 36 feet, it's 52 feet. So you have all this extra room in your street. Here's what it looks like, you have, oh, I did it again. <laughs> I'll see if it comes back. I pushed a different button last time that um, I've been booby trapped. I do want to show you. Does anyone know what button I push? <laughs> ah, here we go. Thank you. All right, if I do that again, it's the lower left button. <laughs> so right now you have 18 foot lanes effectively in that street. If you made them 10 foot lanes, you would have room for buffered bike paths on either side of the road. I'm not saying that's the right solution, but one thing you could do is put bike lanes on both sides of that street, buffered, right? The car is pulled off the curb and the bike lane is protected. It's not up against the moving traffic and there's a barrier to the door zone. Or you could make Main Street like Elm Street and actually have angle parking on one side. There's plenty of room for that. Would you like some more parking on Main Street? So I, I would recommend one of those two solutions. <laughs> now, here's a fun little thing. We discovered about five years ago, but there were, I discovered about five years ago, there've been two studies done, one more recently and one older, that in Europe that found that when you remove the center line from a, a, a street, people on average drive seven miles an hour slower. Seven miles an hour. This is a perfect example of what we call risk homeostasis. People adjust their behavior to the level of risk that they're comfortable with. That yellow line tells you that if, as long as you stay on the right of it, no one's going to hit you. And when it's gone, you're a little more nervous as a driver. We like nervous drivers. And, and so that's a perfect example of a little thing that you could do on almost all of your streets, right? Like Seminary Street is one of dozens and dozens of streets. If this had no center line, it would be a safer street. Now, we have this issue going around town finding all these, well, I was finding all these streets that don't even have room for sidewalks. What do you do there? Well, there's an extreme version of the no center line that's called advisory lanes. And these are starting to spread around the US. This one happens to be in Maine. And what you do is you create a narrower center lane. Maybe it's only 15 feet and you stripe uh, a walking zone, it can be on one side or it can be on both sides, a walking and biking zone on either side, cars stay in the middle, and when another car is coming at them, they make sure there's no bike or pedestrian and they just kind of go off into the shoulder and go back. But this might be a very interesting solution for some of these streets, which people feel very comfortable speeding down just because they're on the right side of the yellow line. So I'd recommend that be considered for some of your spots as well. Now. I hear there's some opposition to sidewalks, uh, but there's, a, there's been a, I've been hearing stories all day about the slow move to, th this picture is not from, from New Canaan, by the way, in case you were wondering, but um, there's, been, there's been a slow move towards working to complete your sidewalk network, particularly in people, in places where people uh, have, uh, you know, a distance between two likely destinations. And of course you need to do that. But people don't pay me to come to their town to tell them they need sidewalks, because you know that already. So I just wanted to say I'm aware of it, and that's great that you're doing that. Um, perhaps in the interim, this is a solution that could serve you quicker and faster than the, the, the building of sidewalks. Hopefully it would not replace the building of sidewalks, but this might be a temporary fix on many of your streets. 
Now, next, parallel parking is an essential barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. If you, can, if you have a street with cars moving on it and there's commerce, you really want to have cars parking on it. Um, this is Fort Lauderdale, where I did a walkability study. You're allowed to park on this side of Himmerishi Boulevard at happy hour. You're not allowed to park on this side. This is happy hour on the park side. And this is happy hour on the not park side. No one wants to be on that sidewalk with cars zipping by at 40 miles an hour, you know, two feet from your table. Um, the other part of this picture is the street trees. Street trees are particularly effective. People thought they were, they call them FHOs, fixed hazardous objects, but street trees actually, um, when you have, have them on a street, there are fewer collisions on the street um, because the cars move more slowly. Sometimes abruptly they move more slowly. Um, <laughs> You know, it's too bad that you hit the street, but better a tree than a pedestrian, and a, a nice row of street trees does a lot towards making an unprotected sidewalk uh, feel protected. So clearly these are expensive to create where you don't have them yet. I hope you have ordinances that say any new street that you build uh, needs to have, uh, or any street that you rebuild needs to have a consistent planting of street trees on their edge. Many cities have that rule. This is what a street feels like without the trees. <laughs> And without the parallel parking, this is a Dutch artist depiction uh, of a street like this one, where you're walking on that sidewalk unprotected in, in any way. Biking is the biggest change that I've seen in the 30 years I've been working in planning. And even in the last 10 years, uh, amazing advancement. Um, this is a great solution. Uh, where, as, as I showed earlier in my proposal for Main Street, you pull the parked cars off the curb, you create a protected bike facility. Um, that's the sort of facility that really mints cyclists. Here's Prospect Park West, you may know it, in Brooklyn. They went from three lanes to two lanes. They actually lost a lane of traffic. And they pulled the cars off the curb, they protected the cyclists. Number of cyclists tripled. Sidewalk cycling, of course, went away. Speeding dropped precipitously. Injury crashes to all users dropped precipitously. And, and remarkably, the street is handling as many cars as it did before, because people were just speeding from red light to red light in the prior scheme. This being New York City, of course, there was a five-year drawn-out lawsuit. Eventually, the bike-hating NIMBY trolls grudgingly surrendered to reality. <laughs> but I show this picture to contrast it with this picture. You know, we used to plan these. I won't draw these anymore. 10 years ago, I put these in streets because that was what this, that's where we were 10 years ago. But now we won't do this anymore. We, we protect the bike lanes. Um, the only time I'll put a bike lane in the street is if there's not a park, you know, there's not parking right next to it. So your daughter isn't in the door zone. Um, there's a number of reasons to protect bike lanes. The, the, another big one is that they always end up with stuff in them if you don't protect them, whether it's trash barrels or dumpsters or the Uber picking me up, which never pulls into the parking lane, even though the parking lane is empty, they always park in the bike lane, or delivery vehicles, or buses, or police who ticket you when you leave the bike lane, uh, bikes in the bike lane. Uh, there's always you know, something in your way. So we advocate for protected lane. And then there's the Shero. We used to put, uh, now, this won the worst Shero in America contest. The Shero, the share the lane in a highway. Um, but a study was done about five years ago that found that actually you don't make a street any safer by putting Sheros in it. And when that was announced, I remember I was in Melbourne and I saw the announcement and I, went, I took to Twitter and I said, can anyone come up with a new Shero symbol? And someone recommended this. But the winner was Queen Anne Greenways of Canada that suggested the Trero. Please don't hit me in the bike lane. Um, so I understand you have a complete streets effort underway. Just because a street contains a bike lane and contains a sidewalk, that doesn't mean it's a complete street. The facility needs to be safe. Now, you have this condition where you have the downtown here, and then you have all this stuff at your southern border. The high school, the middle school, the YMCA, the other train stop, you know, so many, uh, the beautiful park, right? Waveney Hall, all the, where I had an amazing, like, beautiful, I thought I'd arrived at Yale, beautiful lunch today. Um, and they're more than a mile away. And, um, you know, I'm all for, I mean, I recommend improving the, the walkability between these two places. 
And I understand that there's a tradition of school kids getting out on Friday, or at least they used to, and walking downtown, which is great. Um, but I'm really interested in it as a bicycling corridor because it's not the distance that most people will choose to walk, but it's the distance that most people who bike will choose to bike if it's safe. And if it's safe, maybe they'll become cyclists again. Um, so getting from here back north, um, just congratulating you on your walking network that you're developing, but understanding that this looks and feels more like a recreational walking experience. And I really want to connect more people to their destinations more efficiently. So you have South Ave, and South Ave has two 11 and a half foot lanes, uh, and then some pretty, pretty, um, oh, I thought I had another picture, pretty narrow bike lanes that of course aren't protected. And, and they're not that dangerous because there's no door zone, but they're not the type of bike lanes that are gonna attract cyclists. So what if you narrowed the driving lanes to 10 feet with 20 foot clear, put in a little, a little barrier, maybe plant it, and then you can have a 10 foot protected bicycle lane all the way down the side for that whole mile. Now, I'm sorry, I'm calling it South Street, it's South Avenue. Mm -hmm. South Avenue is a state road, so that's gonna be difficult. So now we look at Main Street, which is the other way to get from downtown to your southern destinations. It's a little bit narrower, but you still have room. Now it's got four foot, of the, it's got varying width bike lanes that might not even be bike lanes, and then 11 foot driving lanes, because you've been enforcing an 11 foot standard here, one foot too wide all these years, like, like almost every city. Um, if you make them 10 feet, you still have room for a little barrier, and I'm recommending something like a, like a parking lot wheel stop, or a little bit higher, or if you want to be really New Canaan, a little tiny stone wall that runs the whole length. Clearly, you have to, you have to interrupt it for driveways. But then you have, and, and two-way, two-way eight feet is perfectly fine for a dedicated cycle track. And now you've got a protected cycle facility that's running the whole length of Main Street. So I, I, I'm making Tiger's job much harder, but I'd like you to see you pursue this as well. Um, so that was, that was the big category. The last categories are quite quick, so we're getting near the end. Um, the comfortable walk is a little counterintuitive. Um, we all like to climb mountains and see, uh, I talked to someone today who climbed Everest five times. I imagine that was quite a view. Uh, we, we love having big open spaces to look down on, but in fact, what we really, what we really cherish as pedestrians and as people who make the choice to walk are what we call outdoor living rooms. The evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, were simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. You need to see your predators before they're gonna attack you, but you also need to feel that your flanks are covered from attack. And if your flanks don't feel covered, you don't feel safe, which is why a space like this in Split, where I finally got to this last summer um, in Croatia, it's just amazing because it has prospect and refuge, but the height of the walls as they relate to the width of the space is really important. Uh, we new urbanists have been talking about this for a long time. You know, what's the right ratio? <clears throat> one to one was the Renaissance ideal. Three to one, or one to three, great. Three to one, great. Beyond one to six or so, you don't really feel enclosed anymore, and it's not a space that's comfortable. So six to one, in Salzburg, actually, you know, north of Boston. You know, this is a northern city, perfectly fine uh, in Salzburg. The opposite of Salzburg, of course, is Houston. But this is an old picture of Houston. This, this area has half filled in since this picture was taken. But I still show it to remind us that it's typically the surface parking lot that's the enemy in this conversation about creating well-contained street spaces. Your best spaces are narrow and have, you know, buildings of some height like the gem of, of Forest Street with a wonderful terminated vista at the end as well. That's a lovely outdoor living room. And then you have really important corners, like the corner that this building is on, where you have this missing tooth. And really, it's a missing chin. I mean, it's a big missing thing, <laughs> which is the parking lot that fills this corner. Now, you've probably grown used to this and think it's perfectly natural, but think about how much nicer, now there's a green space here, right? Green spaces really want to feel shaped by buildings. Think about how much nicer this green space would be with, a, with an edge and just how entering downtown would be much nicer if there were buildings there. Now, 
Now, I'm a bit of an artist, so I did this in PowerPoint. <laughs> I know it's ugly. I have, I have some ugly PowerPoint drawings, and then I have some, uh, one better drawing to show you. But the point here is that a, a typical apartment building is 60 feet thick, would hold the corner. You could have a back green. You could have a drive that goes down, so you could park cars underneath if you want. But a building like this, uh, that parks itself, could, uh, could beautifully complete the shape of your downtown. Now, let's move on to the interesting walk. We talked about the one-to-one -one, uh, ratio being the Renaissance ideal. This is a one-to-one -one ratio. It's in Grand Rapids. Now, Grand Rapids is quite a walkable downtown, but no one wants to walk along this street, which connects the two biggest hotels, because you know when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck and the other side is a conference facility, apparently designed in admiration for the parking deck, um, <laughs> you know, it's just boring. So we, we don't want blank walls. You know, there's conversation here about making parking, some parking decks downtown. Um, I'll describe how I'm not against that, but you can't have the parking decks up against the street. You need to hide them one way or another. We learned from Mayor Riley in Charleston, who was mayor for 40 years. Uh, it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of parking. So you get this crust of inhabited edge that makes the parking disappear from the street. Uh, or this one in Miami, I call it the Chia Pet Garage from my old neighborhood in Miami. <laughs> they preserve these mid-century storefronts and then the garage is up behind with its lovely foliage. Um, so here, there's a couple big surface parking lots, which are also boring to walk past, right? It's dull walking past a surface parking lot. How much, not more, how much nicer it would be to have eyes on the street, you know, doors and windows. But also, wouldn't it be great to make better use of these spaces? And if there's a, an opportunity to develop housing in conjunction with structuring the parking, then that helps to pay for structuring the parking. If you structure the parking, a typical parking structure is five stories. That means you, you save four-fifths of the space. Um, and so you can imagine, for example, a parking lot here that's wrapped by a single loaded corridor with apartments on it around. And the same thing here, wrapped. And then here it's bigger, so you can have a full thick building with a little green next to the parking. This is what the ground floor might look like. Then you get a little bit higher and the buildings can kind of, you know, hover over the parking and become much more productive in terms of the amount of housing that they're putting in your downtown. So the combination of par turning parking lots to parking structures, um, which you can see are, are very large, right? So you're increasing your downtown parking tremendously if you wish to do so, and then combining that with a lot of housing, which you know I believe your downtown needs, or, or, or doesn't need but should have, um, is a, a nice, future solution for these lots, and you'll notice the parking is hidden from the street. You don't see it from the street. And then, <clears throat> oh, so we're not done, but here we say, I've completed the list. So I've taken you through <coughs> these four categories, the useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting walk. I want to apply them to one particular site, which, which immediately struck me as the place that needs most attention, or the, the greatest opportunity in your downtown. Um, I've worked on a lot of uh, transit-oriented developments. The smartest place to put housing is on transit. The closer to transit you put it, the less likely people are to own cars. It's completely normal in a incredibly, like your downtown not only has so many amenities, it's even got supermarkets. So I mean, if you live near downtown, you really don't need a car. And here's where Here's where I ask you to put yourselves out of your own head and thinking about what you need and what you want and realize that there's a lot of people who are different than you. And there's a lot of people who want to live in an apartment in an incredible downtown like yours without a car. And that market is tremendously underserved. So even if it's only five or 10% of the people, even if it's only 3% of the renters or buyers in, in the real estate market this, these days, what they want is not available, and it's certainly not available attainably. And so whoever in their downtown, and we learned this in Somerville, Massachusetts, whoever in downtown builds housing with no parking, that's got great access to transit and the amenities of a downtown, those buildings fill up. There's a new development in car-dependent Tempe, Arizona, you may have heard of, called Cul-de-Sac. It's 700 units, 
in Phoenix with no parking, and it's full. Now, there is, a, there is a light rail that connects them to the rest of unwalkable Phoenix, right? But this, this unmet market exists, and you will get them to live in New Canaan if you allow them to live in New Canaan. And they will bring vitality and life and spending and activity even more so to your downtown without gumming your downtown up with, with cars. So um, I was looking at your train station and your very large parking lot that sits right here that's owned by the city. And so the city can take the initiative and do something with it. And what the city should do with it is this. <laughs> this is one example. Do you like my fade? Should I do that again? <laughs> fade. So the, 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 um, the, the, the solution, one solution of several possible solutions is to structure the parking, stick it back against the train tracks where it's not bothering anybody, right? And then create a one way, and I say one way because it's pretty tight, so we don't want this road to be any bigger than necessary. A one way drive in and out Flank that with residential buildings that can have shops if you want, shops and other activities and amenities below. Um, pop out from the parking structure in this stair tower right here, which then gives you a nice path to the train. Extend, you see we have a little bit of single loaded units here. Uh, there's a hallway here, uh, a little bit of single loaded, but this is a big double loaded hallway apartment building, a big double loaded hallway, double loaded hallway, very efficient probably about 200 units possible in this location. Um, we're parking all the cars that were in, in that parking lot, and then some. You could allow some of the residents to come with cars, but I'm suggesting that, that you don't. That you actually sign leases, as has been done in Washington and other places, you sign leases that say, I will not come with a car. And that you uh, are able to put, to put this new residential in your downtown. There's a lovely kind of uphill slope here and a facade of a nice looking building that now has city offices in it, among other things. You can see how that makes a nice front door to kind of a tilted plane of a green that sits, ooh, fade, that sits right there. Um, and what you've done is you've just created a nice little new piece of your downtown that's housing a ton of people and um, still parking everyone who is coming for the train. An earlier scheme, and I, I believe other schemes which could not be dug out were also made for the site uh, this is a nice design, clearly very talented architect. However, um, what I prefer is a scheme that makes a place rather than a building with just green space around it that would not be, um, you know, a, uh, as much of a downtown environment. Also, this scheme proposes two stories of underground parking. And uh, underground parking is about $50,000 a space. Above ground parking is about $25,000 a space. So particularly if the city's involved in funding this, I recommend a structure and not, and not underground uh, if you can do it. So um, forgive me for, for, uh, for doing that, but uh, I'm, I'm ready to come back and build this if anyone wants to work with me. And uh, I do think that um, uh, you know, more people in your downtown is uh, the way to take it to the next level. It's already great. Uh, it could be even better, and it could be something that you're, uh, I hope you're willing to share this treasure with more people. So I believe that's my talk. I like to end by um, describing some resources available to you. There are the books, and uh, for sale outside, in addition to Walkable City, is Suburban Nation, which tells the town versus sprawl story. Not this one, this is Chinese. Um, um, for the real geeks among you, there's the Smart Growth Manual, which we usually don't sell, um, but they sent some here, and uh, that's kind of self-explanatory, but take a peek at that. The book I would love for you to read if you haven't is Walkable City. This is the tool that people use to convince <clears throat> each other and their leaders to, uh, to, to, to try to change their, their cities, and um, it's, it's, I've, I've found it to be useful, so I recommend it. And then if you are, if you're in the trenches, if this is your job, or your hobby, or you're an activist, um, the other book I would recommend that's also outside is called Walkable City Rules, which is full of data and tables and photographs and, and actually 101 rules that are much more about making the changes rather than just advocating for them. So that, that's what is here tonight. 
I mentioned the TED Talk. There is a second TED Talk that is um, called Four Ways to Make a City More Walkable, also under my name. Uh, that is, th this one is the why, as I told you, it has no pictures. It's just a big sales pitch for walkability. But uh, this one is like my lecture tonight, just shorter. And if, if someone didn't come tonight and you want them to see a short version, you can show them that. Um, our website, uh, my partner Chris Dempsey and I, our firm is called Spec Dempsey. You go to specdempsey.com and you'll see a lot of other uh, resources. And finally, because you guys aren't that far away, um, I teach a course at Harvard just for two days every summer. 